All right, the uh, part of the chapter I want to home in on is verse number 11. That's Galatians chapter number 3, verse number 11. The Bible reads, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Now I want you to turn back to Habakkuk chapter number 2, verse number 4. This is a quotation from Habakkuk chapter number 2, verse number 4. It's also quoted in Romans chapter number 1, verse number 17. And Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 38. Habakkuk chapter number 2, and that's verse number 4 is where this is quoted from. The Bible says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Now, as Baptists, the distinguishing element of us from other Protestants, or we're not even a Protestant, but other denominations of Christianity, if you refer to Baptists as a denomination, would be that we believe that salvation is by faith alone. Now, a lot of other you know, uh, you know, uh, denominations, if you will, or sects of Christianity, whatever you want to refer to them as, They'll claim that salvation is by faith alone, but when you really get to the nitty-gritty of the matter, they don't. They believe that it's, you know, by baptism. They believe that it's by doing certain deeds. You know, even Martin Luther himself, who supposedly, you know, uh, reformed the church, which is referring to the Catholic Church. That's why we're not Protestants. We didn't come out of the Catholic Church. We're not, you know, we weren't protesting. Anabaptists is really where we came from in our history, and we existed long before Martin Luther. He says that, you know, the, he read this verse, the just shall live by faith, and that's what conformed his views to believing that salvation is by faith alone. But when you really look into what Martin Luther believed, that he did not believe that salvation was by faith alone. He believed that salvation was by faith plus baptism plus what he would consider the sacraments, and one would be baptism and the other being, you know, he actually believed in transubstantiation. Which, which is that he believes that the bread and the wine that they administer, the, the clergy administers, turns into the blood and the, and the body, the flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is ridiculous. So really what sets us apart as Baptists, what we're, our most distinguishing factor or element is that we believe that salvation is by faith alone. And we pound that all the time. Salvation is by faith alone, right? We go out so many all the time, so we're repeating it. We're preaching it constantly. That's what sets true biblical Christianity apart from all religions of the world. And because Baptists are those that hold to true biblical Christianity, it sets us apart from other professing Christians or from other, like I said, Christian sects or denominations, right? And all the time when you hear Baptists talking about faith, they're always relating it unto salvation. And one thing that I, I believe that gets downplayed, that doesn't get enough attention, is the importance of faith in your everyday Christian life. The title of the sermon this morning is Living by Faith. Now first I want you to understand very clearly that the faith that is required for salvation, is, it's, it, it takes place in a moment. It just takes place in one second. At, you know, Jesus says in John chapter number 5, verse number 24, he said, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed. Right then at that moment, from death unto life. So at that moment you are saved. You're passed from death unto life. Baptists, when you go into Baptist churches, you hear preaching on salvation. You hear preaching on it's only by faith. But what do they focus on? They focus on when you move forward in your Christian life, keep the commandments. When you move forward in your Christian life, you know, he that loveth me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments, right? Also, again, don't nitpick what I'm saying. That's important, too. You need to keep, keep the commandments. Right. But listen to me. The most important thing, even after salvation, even after you have that faith and you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're saved, the most important ingredient to have a successful Christian life, moving forward also, is living by faith. Living by, you know, the belief and trust in God's word. Now, I want you to turn over again real quick to Proverbs chapter number 3, verse number 5. Proverbs chapter number 3, verse number 5. And we're going to look at the different areas of life of which we should have faith. Proverbs chapter number 3, verse number 5, a very famous passage. 
Proverbs chapter number 3, verse number 5. Galatians chapter number 2, verse number 19. Paul says this. It's just one chapter from what we read previously. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And he says, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we can see that after his salvation, he says, the life that I'm now living in the flesh I'm living by the faith of the Son of God. That's what he's living by. He's living by putting his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, even after the moment that he had trusted Christ to save him. His faith is in God. His faith is in God's word. Look at Proverbs chapter number 3, verse number 5. The Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Now look at verse 6. In all thy ways. So not in some areas of life. Not when it just comes to some subjects and some things. You know, he says, In all thy ways. Acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Now, in the New Testament, the word that's primarily used is believe. You look in the Old Testament, the substituted word for that, the word that is synonymous for that, synonymous for that, is trust. So what's talking about right now, and that's what believe means. Trust in the Lord. Put your faith in God. Trust in God that his, that his commandments, that his counsels, that his advice is what you should do in your life. The decisions that you should make should be based upon him. And what does he say? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine understanding. So what's the warning? The warning is not to think you know that, what decisions you should make. The warning is not to think that you can decide best for yourself, but rather trust in what God has told you you should do in your life. Put your faith in God. Believe in God. What does it say? Live by faith. You need to live your life by faith in God's word. You need to live your life by faith in God's commandments, by faith in God's counsel. And in, in what areas of life? He says, in all thy ways. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. I want you to turn over to Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 30. If you want to live a, a successful Christian life after salvation, after you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, how are we to be successful? What's the most important thing? If I'm going to have one thing, which this should not be the right attitude, but just to understand what's most important... If I'm going to have one thing, one ingredient in my Christian life, what should I have? It's the same thing that got you saved. It's faith. It's believing in the Lord. It's trusting in God. Look at Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 30. Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 30. He says, Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? Oh, ye of little faith. So he's talking about our clothing, talking about our garments, right? Verse 31, therefore take no thought. So it means don't worry about that. Don't be concerned about that. Take no, therefore take no thought saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewith shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness... And all these things shall be added unto you. Look at verse 34. Take therefore no thought. That's a strong statement. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil there. Notice he doesn't say, don't worry about tomorrow. He, he says this. Think about the words. Every word matters. He says, take no thought. He's saying, don't worry at all. Like, don't ever just concern yourself or worry. In the context of what? What people worry about the most. And what is that? The necessities of life, finances, right? Food, if you're going to have food, if you're going to have drink, and if you're going to have clothing and lodging. Those would be the four things that you would say, those are the most important things in life. And what, is, what does Jesus Christ say when he's teaching? In his most famous teaching... Right, the Sermon on the Mount, he says, don't worry about that. Don't worry about money, don't worry about food, don't worry about drink, don't worry about clothing. In a nutshell, the way we would say this today would be, don't worry about your finances. And what is, he, what is the, the point of this passage? Look at verse number 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So what is he trying to explain to you? He's trying to get your priorities fixed. He's trying to make sure that you have your priorities right. And he explains to you that actually, if you just trust God, and what does he mean by not worrying? Obviously, you have to just be trusting God. Don't worry about it. Just believe that God will add these things unto you. Don't sit there and concern yourselves about money. Don't sit there and concern yourselves about whether you're going to have clothing, 
whether you're going to have food, whether you're going to have drink, whether you're going to have lodging, don't worry about those things. Just believe that God will add those things unto you. Now, you can't just go out and live, you know, just a sinful, wicked life and just expect God to just bless you, be lazy, and not keep the commandments. Of course, right? That's why he says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. So if we have our priorities correct, if we have our priorities right, and, and what is most important to us in our life is seeking the kingdom of God, is seeking the things that, that, that have to do with God, following his commandments, walking in the light of his word, right? Following the Lord, if we do that, then God promises us that there should be no reason you even worry about that. If you are doing the things that you should be doing in your life, I can submit to you today, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about your paycheck. Don't worry about whether you're going to pay your bills. Don't worry about if you're doing what you should be doing. If you're going to work, if you're laboring hard, if you're being a good employee, if you're serving your boss and serving your master as unto the Lord, as though we are as we are commanded, then you should not, as per Jesus, you should not be worrying about tomorrow. You should not be worrying about clothing. You should not be worrying about food. Now, is this something that we do constantly? Constantly, isn't it? Everybody does it, don't they? They just, they, you know, it's it, and especially in the society that we live in, people are just a fixated upon money and they're a fixated upon finances and getting a better job and always moving forward. That should not be a concern. That should not be something that we talk about. That should not be something that we're worried about. Now, of course, it is important, right? But we shouldn't be talking about it in the context of just like constantly worrying about it, constantly being concerned about it, and leaning upon our own understanding and thinking, you know, I'm going to figure this out. That's not the attitude that we should have. Even when it comes to the bare necessities of life, that which sustains life, that which keeps us alive, Jesus says, take no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. He explains right before that, the verse right prior to that, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he says that all these things shall be added unto you. Does everybody believe that the words of Jesus are true? Amen. And what does he promise you? He says, if you seek first the kingdom of God, all these things will be added unto you. What's he telling you? Don't worry. This is, this is you know, in, in our terms today, he's saying this. Don't worry about food. Don't worry about, you know, money. Don't worry about clothing. Don't worry about drink, right? Don't worry about any of these things. But if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, I'll give you all these things. I'll make sure that I provide these things for you. Just trust me that I'll do it, right? Does that sound like, a, you know, an adequate summary of what we just read? Is that the way that we live our life? What's he telling you? Just follow my commands and live your life by faith. Now to the unsaved heathen, to those that do not believe in the Bible, that sounds crazy to them, right? That sounds insane to them. But I believe the words of Jesus. I don't care what they think. I believe that this is the Lord, that this is God that spoke these words, and that he is able to give me the things that I need. And you know what? In this life, we are commanded as Christians to live our life by faith. And, and, you know, that, that can be foolishness to the world. You know, the, you know, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to the world. A lot of the things of the Bible, that's foolishness to them because what do they want? They want evidence. They want, they want to see proof of these things, right? They want to see the evidence that God's going to do this for them. But no, you're not, that's not what you're supposed to do as a Christian. That's not the attitude that you should have as a Christian. You should just trust that God's going to give you those things. See, and sometimes in life, and this is what's very important, it's easy to make that decision when there's nothing to lose. It's easy to say, hey, I'm going to trust in the Lord that he's going to provide for me when you're not really making a daring decision, when you're not really making a hard decision. Do you know when, when you know, the rubber really meets the road is when you could possibly lose something? And what does God say? Is there an exception? No, lean not upon your own understanding. That's when you would start to think, well, you know what? If I make this decision, it would be best. Are you, is, is that a decision that would be seeking first the kingdom of God? Whatever it may be in your life, any decisions, we all encounter, especially you know, a lot of people, families, you know, specifically that are here, that have moved here, you know, it can take a while as far as finances and stuff after a big move to, things can be rocky for a while to settle down. But you know what? It doesn't matter. That's not the priority. You need to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Amen. and all these things will be added unto you. Amen. Once you turn to another passage, let's look at Leviticus chapter 25, verse 19. Actually, I'll have you, I'm going to have you turn to a different, different location. Hey, well, we'll go to Leviticus 25. Go ahead. Yeah, we'll go to Leviticus 25. Leviticus chapter number 25. 
want to give you an example of this, of, of those that were God's nation in the Old Testament. Something that along the lines of exactly what we're talking about right now, the necessities of life where God promises that he will provide. They're not supposed to lean upon their own understanding, but God promises that he will provide for them. Look at Leviticus 25. Look at verse, we'll start at 18. Wherefore ye shall do my statutes and keep my judgments and do them, and ye shall dwell in the land in safety. And the land shall yield her fruit, and ye shall eat your fill and dwell therein in safety. And if ye shall say, What shall we eat the seventh year? Behold, we shall not sow nor gather in our increase. Then I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth fruit for three years. And ye shall sow the eighth year, and eat yet of old fruit until the ninth year, until her fruits come in, shall ye eat of the old store. Now this is a perfect Old Testament example of what we just read in Matthew chapter number 6. So I want you to look at verse number 18. What does he tell them first? Wherefore ye shall do my statutes, and keep my judgments, and do them, and ye shall dwell in the land in safety. So notice the very first thing that he says to them is to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He tells them, hey, keep the commandments. I want you to dwell. And then he gives them a promise along with that, doesn't he? If you do this, you'll dwell in the land in safety. If you, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now I want you to look at what the context is here, here as well. When we read verse 19, he says, And the land, so if you do this, and the land shall yield her fruit, and ye shall eat your fill and dwell therein in safety. And if he shall say, what shall we eat the seventh year? So he's talking about the Sabbath, right? When they move in, the Israelites, when they come in and they inhabit the land of Canaan, the, the, you know, the promised land, they are to sow and to reap for six years. But once that seventh year comes around, they're not to sow any crop. They're not to sow anything, any seeds at all, period. They have to just trust God that he will provide for them. Once, it, once, once harvest time comes, correct? Now, if anyone knows anything about like agriculture, obviously, and even the Bible just teaches us this plainly, because everything, practically everything we can world, learn in the world, on all subjects almost, you can learn from the Bible. And the Bible, the Bible teaches that, that you know, man has to cultivate the ground in order to get a sufficient outcome or sufficient produce, right? So in this case, what are they doing? What are the chances or odds just out in the world, if you, you know, with, with, without God, without the Lord, that you're just going to go to land, go to a, a piece of a field or a crop, right? And you're going to sow your seed for six years, and then you're just not going to cultivate the ground. You're not going to do anything the seventh year, and then you're going to have that which is sufficient the seventh year. And so you're not going to do it for the six years, but then the seventh year, you're going to have the same type of outcome. You're going to have the same sort of produce. Almost, you know, you're going to, it's going to be such a minimal amount that it's going to be ridiculous if you know anything about agriculture. It's going to be very, very small. I mean, you would have something because the seeds just replant themselves, but it would be almost nothing. It would not be enough to sustain your family. So you know what's going on here is there's a miracle that's taking place. There, God is performing a miracle on the, seventh, on the seventh year. He's saying, I don't want you to sow anything. I want you to keep my commandments. I want you to follow in my statutes. And I want you to just trust me that on the seventh year, once that comes around, I'm just going to provide your food for you. Does that sound familiar? Kind of like Matthew chapter number 6, right? When Jesus is teaching the same thing, it's because it's the same Lord of the Old Testament that's walking there and teaching to them, right? On the, Mount, the Sermon on the Mount. And it's the exact same teaching. He tells them to start off, hey, keep my commandments, keep my statutes, right? God's telling them, make sure you keep my, and you'll dwell in the land in safety. Say, I'm going to keep you safe, right? And, he's, and then he gives them the command. And what's the whole purpose of this? Why would God tell them on, this, on the seventh year, I don't want you to sow or reap at all. I don't want you to cultivate the ground. I don't want you to do anything. Why? Because he wants them to just trust him. That's why he wants them to just put their faith in him. He wants them, this is not for salvation. They don't have to believe God is going to bring them fruit so that they can go to heaven, right? He wants them in their everyday lives, for that which is most important, to live by faith. He wants them to just trust, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Follow my statutes, right? And just believe me that I will provide for you what you need. And like I said, that's very easy to do when there's nothing on the line. Can you imagine this being, you know, you being put into this situation where now you have to basically just not work, you know, in this context, you have to just not sow, not reap what you would, would be reaping. You would just have to be sowing, but then you would have to just expect that you would have enough. I mean, think about that. 
once the ninth year came. Think about that. Isn't that crazy? But you know what? They had to just trust God. They had to just live by faith that God would be able to provide for them. And we need to do this. nothing different today. We need to trust that God will give us the things that we need. But what needs to be in place? Our priorities need to be in place. We need to be seeking first the kingdom of God. We need to be wanting to do that which would be pleasing unto God first and trust that God would provide these things for us. I want you to turn, I want to look at a couple of examples of this in the Bible. Go to 2 Kings chapter number 7, where this actually plays out. 2 Kings chapter number 7. So there's many areas of life where this may take place. Obviously, the most important is where we started. Food, drink, shelter, clothing, things like that. Things that are necessities to life. You know, another area would be confrontational areas like discipline. Where you have the world's counsel, you have the world's advice, you have like, you know, people like Benjamin Spock that are, you know, presented as being the professional. If you don't listen to him, if you don't follow the parental advice that he gives, then you're going to fail. You're going to fail. You're not going to be a good parent. And then the Bible's advice is just totally opposite to that, isn't it? Totally opposite to the people that would be the professionals, right? The, the, the children, you know, uh, uh, the therapist, if you will. These people that are supposed to be... You know, uh, just they, they know these types of things. They're the professionals, like I said. You need to go to them to get your advice. But then the Bible's advice is totally different. So what do you have to do? You just have to have your faith in God's word. You have to just believe that God's word is right. That God's word is correct when it tells you you, you need to be spanking your children. You need to be teaching your children the Bible. You need to be disciplining your child. When your children are bad, when they, dis, when they disobey you, when they're disobedient to you, you need to whip them. What would the world say? They tell you you're crazy. They tell you you're beating your children, right? So what do you have to do? You have to live by faith. In all areas of life, why? You have to trust that God's word is correct. When the, the world's telling you, no, you're crazy, you're stupid, you're a maniac, right? And that's what it's coming to, where people think if you're spanking your child, they think that you're abusing your children. But you know, the Bible, the Bible says that if you don't spank your children, you're abusing your children. Right. The Bible says the exact opposite. So which one do you believe in? How do you make that decision? You have to believe it by faith. You have to just believe that God's word is true. And the Bible teaches that what's going to happen when you believe that God's word is true? What will God do? It says that God will provide things for you, right? God will bless you, right? If you walk in faith, if you live by faith, we, we won't have to worry about anything. God will give us the things that we need. There will be a good outcome. We know that we would have good children. That would be the, the, pro, the result of disciplining your kids is that they would turn out right. Right? And you have to just, do you see the outcome right in the beginning? Well, that wouldn't be living by faith, would it? You have to just believe that when the time comes when they go and they live out on their own, they start to make their own decisions, that that was the right, correct decision that you had made. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 6 says, Therefore we are always, this is actually 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 6, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that, whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, and then it says this, verse 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. So the decisions we make are not based upon sight. If your decisions were based upon sight, if your decisions were based upon the things that you see and the things that you are able to just look at with your own eyes and analyze and then try to determine your own decisions, do you think you would make the, the, the decision that the Bible puts forth? Do you think that you would go the route that the Bible says to go? Of course not, right? That's why you have to live by faith. So look at, uh, did you guys turn to 2 Kings? Let's look at 2 Kings. We'll look at it, uh, you know, an example of this where a man, just based upon his lack of faith, he misses out on a blessing. Whoops. 2 Kings, that is, chapter number 7. 2 Kings, chapter number 7. 2 Kings, chapter number 7. Look at verse number 1. Then Elisha said, we'll get the whole context here. Then Elisha said, hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Then a Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not, but shalt not eat thereof. So Elisha comes and he prophesies in a time of famine, that there's going to be an abundance of food. You have this man here who, who on whom the, land, the, the, the king leans, right? And he's just like, he's mocking. He's saying, if God made windows in heaven, might this thing be? He's saying that that's not going to happen. Obviously, there aren't literal windows in heaven. 
right? Maybe flat earthers believe that, but there's not literal windows in heaven, right? He's saying that's not going to happen. That's ridiculous. That's his point. He's mocking what Elisha. The man of God comes. Everybody knows this guy is the man of God. This is the prophet. And he comes and he preaches God's word. And this guy's like, that's ridiculous. That's not going to happen. That's, you know, today's, you know, terms, that's how he said, that's not going to happen. That's ridiculous. That's stupid. If there was windows in heaven, maybe it's something like that could happen. But there's not. That's his point, right? So he's mocking that. When Elisha says, we're going to have an abundance of food. In the time of famine. Now, does it look like that's going to be true? What would you have to have in order to believe that such a thing is going to happen? You have to have faith. You have to have to believe God's word, right? Now I want you to look at verse number 3. Keep reading. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate. And they, and they said one to another, why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city. And we shall die there. And if we sit, sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall into the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, <clears throat> we shall but die. And they rose up in the twilight to go unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent. So now they're discovering that there's all these, all these riches. There's all this food and all this drink, all this gold and all this silver. These are the four lepers that were, that were in Samaria previously. So it says in verse 9, Then they said one to another, We do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. So he wants to go tell the king of Samaria. So they came and called unto the porter of the city, and they told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied and asses tied, and the tents as they were. And he called the porters, and they told it to the king's house within. The king arose in the night and said unto his servants, I will now show you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we be hungry. Therefore are they gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, When they come out of the city, we shall catch them alive and get into the, tents, in, into the city. So he thinks that these guys are like spies, basically, or they're infiltrators trying to trick them, and they know that they're hungry. So if they say, Hey, there's food out here, all the army's going to go out there, and then they're going to be able to attack them. They're not going to be prepared. It says in verse 13, And one of his servants answered and said, Let some take, I pray thee, five of the horses that remain. So he's saying just a few people go and check it, just to see if I'm telling you the truth. Five of the horses that remain which are left in the city, behold, they are, they are as all the multitude of Israel that are left in it. Behold, I say, they are even as all the multitude of the Israelites that are consumed. And let us send and see. They took therefore two chariot horses, and the king sent after the host of the Syrians, saying, Go and see. And they went after them unto Jordan, and lo, all the way was full of garments and vessels which the Syrians had cast away in their haste. And the messengers returned and told the king. And the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians. Look at this. So a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel. And then he says, according to the word of the Lord. Now, if you were that man that was standing there, when he, that, leaned, that the king leans upon him, leans upon his hand, when someone just walks up to you and there's a, there's a, a, you know, a terrible famine where you have, they, you know, almost no one just has food at this point. People are dying. The horses are dying, he's explaining. Almost all of them are consumed away. And he comes to you and he says, hey, tomorrow, you know, he explains in, in their money's terms, he says, so a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel, so for one shekel. He says a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel, which would be it was very cheap because there's an abundance of it, right? You're able to buy it for almost nothing. At that time, if you had fine flour, you were going to be buying it for a very high cost because it's very rare. So he's saying it's going to be sold for a shekel because there's going to be an abundance of it. You can see, if you were walking by sight, why the man mocked and thought that that would be ridiculous. And oftentimes in our lives, 
When something happens and God's word says, hey, make this decision, if you look at it from the flesh's perspective, if you look at it from just walking by side, you can think that's a ridiculous decision. How could something like that play out? But then God tells the story, and it actually is completely sensible, isn't it? It actually makes perfect sense how such a thing could happen. It actually, there's a chain of events that takes place when the Syrians are scared, they leave and they have to rush out all in one moment, all in one second. And then you have these four sick men that are just like, you know, they're just having a casual conversation. If we, you know, why stay here? If we stay here, we're going to die. We might as well go search and see if we can find some food. We might as well go do something. They stumble upon all these things. They go back to the king and they give him word. You see how God worked this out? And when you, when you look at the situation from the very beginning, it's like, that's not going to happen. That's ridiculous. How in the condition we're in, we have no, no money. We're in a famine. We're surrounded by an army. How in the world are we going to get so much flour in here that it's going to be sold for a chef? But then you read the story, and it's like, well, that makes perfect sense. It's actually a sensible story. You know what? In our lives, very often, when you look back, and you're, and you're thinking, and, you, and you're about to make a hard decision, and it's a decision like this, where the king has to live by faith. He has to say, hey, I'm going to send those guys over there and check things out. Or you have to, you know, like the man who's leaning upon, whom the king leans upon his hand, you have to just believe what the Word of God says. You have to just believe that the Word of the Lord is correct, that the Word of the Lord is going to be the correct decision or the correct path that you should take, that you should keep that commandment. Oftentimes in our life, when we're in a situation like that, once it's all you know, said and done at the very end, you look back and you're like, why was I even worried? It makes perfect sense. The story makes perfect sense after you read it. I can see exactly how God was able to bring me to where I am today. Why was I even worried in the first place? Why was I even concerned that I didn't have money? Why was I even concerned that we weren't going to be able to pay our bills or we weren't going to be able to purchase what we needed or we weren't going to have enough for this or that or you know, buy our food? We had plenty of money. When I look back, if I could go back, I would just not be concerned anymore. I would just not worry about it. But what's the key to it? You have to live by faith. You have to seek ye first the kingdom of God. You have to have your priorities right. Right? I want you to keep reading too because it's very, very interesting. Look at verse 17 now. And the king appointed the Lord on whose hand he leaned to have the charge of the gate. It says, And the people trod upon him in the gate, and he died, as the man of God had said, who spake when the king came when, who spake when the king came down to him. And then it goes on, and it came to pass that the man of God had spoken to the king, saying, Two measures of barley for a shekel, and a measure of fine flour for a shekel shall be tomorrow. About this time in the gate of Samaria. You know the only person that didn't get to that didn't get to take part in that was the guy that didn't believe that God could do it. The guy that looked at the situation and what was he doing? Was he walking by faith? No, he's walking by sight. He looked at, at, at the scenario and he's like, this can't happen. That's stupid. That's ridiculous. That's dumb that you would even believe this. If God would make windows in heaven, might such a thing be? He's probably laughing and mocking in Elisha's face, saying, "That's look at everybody here. Does that seem like it's realistic? No, but guess what? He, because of his lack of faith, he was the only one that didn't get to take part in the, in the blessings. You can see these patterns all throughout the Bible, where in the Old Testament, when God tells them, hey, don't, I don't want you to sow or reap the Sabbath, the, you know, the Sabbath year, which would be the seventh year. I don't want you to do anything, but I'm going to give you the blessing if you just trust me and believe me. Put God first. You know, keep my commandments and just believe me. You have to trust me that I'll do it, and then I'll give you the blessing. What, what, what is the, the perfect picture of a blessing in the Bible? It's like fruit, right? It's bringing forth fruit. That's, what, that's like the perfect picture of what a blessing is. It's having enough for life, right? Sustaining life, the things that are necessary for life. He says, if you just believe me, I'll do that. And you know what? It's not a coincidence that why did the Israelites get ran out of their land? What was the reason? Because they're, they're not serving God. They're worshiping false idols. They're, wor they're worshiping other gods, right? Therefore, they don't believe God. And you know, when they were taken out of their land, you know how long their land set desolate? 70 years. That's because for 490 years, they were not letting the land sit for that seventh year. Doesn't it make perfect sense that they wouldn't be, you know, keeping that Sabbath year? When the whole reason they were taken out of the land to begin with was because they didn't believe in the Lord. Because they weren't worshiping God, they weren't serving God. So you know what he did? He made them, how long did he make them stay? You, well, you don't want to believe me? You, don't, you didn't want to trust me all those years? Well, I'm just going to make your land, I'll make your land sit. You see how God is? 
You know, that's a point that I actually didn't use in my sermon. It just popped in my mind about you sow what you reap. When I talked about how repeatedly in the Bible God is an exactor. I, I may have used that. God is an exactor. He's very specific. And then if you do something to someone else, very often that punishment will turn around on your own head. Right? So they, for, for you know, 490 years, there's supposed to be 70 Sabbaths where their land sits desolate. And God just says, keep my commandments and just trust me and I'll provide you with what you need during that period of time. And because they're not believing in God, because they're worshiping idols and they don't believe in the one and only true Lord... They don't keep that, that Sabbath for 490 years. So it would be 70 Sabbaths. He removes them out of the land, and he lets the land sit desolate for 70 years. Why? Because they're not trusting God. Because they weren't believing in the Lord. Let's look at another example of this. Go to Hebrews chapter number 3. It's another Old Testament example. Now, a moment ago, I said that one of the greatest pictures of a blessing is like bringing forth fruit. Bringing forth fruit. Another one of the greatest pictures, if not the greatest picture of a blessing, is the promised land. Being able to inherit the promised land, that was what, in the Old Testament, what seemed to be the, the, the first or the physical, because oftentimes in the Bible, when there's a prophecy, there will be a physical fulfillment, and then there's also a spiritual fulfillment. We know that, that the, the, the completion of that prophecy is actually when we inherit New Jerusalem. That is the completion of the prophecy. That is the true promise being fulfilled. But there was the Old Testament where God brought them into the land of Canaan. And that was a blessing. It was a land that flowed with milk and honey. It just, it just encapsulated or defined what a true blessing was, right? And being able to inherit that land, that would be them receiving a blessing in a time of hardship. And look at Hebrews chapter number 3, verse number 16, what the Bible says about those inheriting the land. It says, for some... When they had heard, did provoke. Talking about the hearing of the preaching of Moses. Did provoke. Howbeit, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved forty years. It says, was it not with them that had sinned? So though, who was Moses grieved? Who was the Lord actually in this context grieved? It says it was those with those that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness. Verse 18, and to whom swear he... That they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. So the greatest blessing that God ever presents to anyone while on this earth, to mankind, is the land of Canaan, which is the land of, which would be Israel today, right? And what was the reason why certain people were not able to inherit that blessing? They weren't able to get that blessing. The same reason why the man on whom the king leaned wasn't able to inherit his blessing, wasn't it? It's because they didn't believe God. Now, a lot of people say, well, I agree this is a picture of salvation because the Old Testament land of Canaan was a picture of New Jerusalem. That's the true you know, uh, Jerusalem. That's the true land that we're going to inherit. You know, it's a, uh, you know, the, it's the foundations that God laid, right? A lot of people will misinterpret this and say, well, all those people just weren't saved. That's not true. And a Christian can, can have this exact same attitude, and a Christian can do these exact same things where they do not inherit blessings because of, you know, a lack of faith or not living by faith or living by sight. Do you know who another person was that didn't inherit the land? Moses. Do you know why Moses didn't inherit the land? Because he didn't believe God. What was the reason? Because he, he told him, you need to speak to the rock. And what did he do? He struck the rock. And you know what God said the reason why he didn't inherit the land? The reason why he didn't get that blessing? Because he didn't walk by faith, he walked by sight. Because he didn't, he didn't obey God when God said, hey, seek ye first the kingdom of God and, and his righteousness. You need to keep God's commandments. You need to keep God's statutes. Just like when God said, hey, plant for six years, but then just don't even cultivate the land. Don't sow. Don't reap. Nothing the seventh year. Nothing at all. Okay? Don't do anything. And I'll just trust me that I'll provide for you. You know, Elisha comes and he's like, we're not going to be able to do anything. For food, God's just going to provide the food for us. We're going to have tomorrow in these gates, in here, you know, they can't even leave the gates of the city. And the man of God comes, the messenger on God's behalf, speaking God's words. This is God's message. And he says, hey, just believe God. God is going to have tomorrow, there's going to be a measure of fine flour that's sold for a shekel. And the guy's like, that's ridiculous. And guess what? He didn't get to take part in the blessing. You know when you're making decisions in your life and, and you start thinking, well, if I do this, which I know this is 
the right thing to do. If this is the time, if this is, you know, a, a hard decision that you're going to be in or a hard circumstance that you're going to be in, people often do this. It's very common. This is very practical, the sermon this morning. If I make this decision, then I'm scared that this is going to happen. Or if I, you know, if I go out on a limb and I actually do, you know, I actually give my 10%, it doesn't even look like I'm going to be able to pay my bills. If I actually tithe every week, when I look at the numbers, it doesn't add up. When I break down my, you know, you know, my finances, it doesn't even look like I'm going to be able to pay all of my bills. What do you, how do you think it looked to all of those in the gates of Samaria? When he says, hey, tomorrow there's going to be a measure of fine flour sold for a shepherd. How do you think it looked when, when they're traveling around in the wilderness for 40 years? And they're like, yeah, they keep saying, you know, we're going to inherit this promised land. We're gonna, I'm going to take you to a land that's flowing with milk and honey. What did they have to do? They had to seek first the kingdom of God. And all these things would be added unto them. They had to have that initial faith. They had to first believe God that he was able to do that. And you know what happens when you don't believe God and you don't step out and you don't trust God and you don't make decisions based upon the Bible, based upon God's commands, based upon what God would have for you? You end up missing out on blessings. You, what you do is you lean upon your own understanding. You think, this just doesn't make rational sense for me to do this. Yeah, it's called living by faith. You may look at the scenario and say, this doesn't look like it can work out. This doesn't make any sense at all. You know, why are we out in the wilderness for 40 years? You know, why are we just, why did we leave Egypt? We had everything we needed there, right? You know, we had the cucumbers and the melons and the garlics and the leaf, right? We had everything we needed. Why did we leave there in the first place? Right? You know what they had to do? They had to live by faith. When they're getting ready to, imagine getting ready to cross a massive sea. Imagine when you're traveling, you know, to the, to the land of Canaan, the blessing, and you come under this just mat, put yourselves in their shoes, and there's just this huge sea. Like, you can't even see the land to the other side. What do you have to do? I mean, that, you, you know, if you're living by sight, what are you going to say? This is over. This didn't last very long. You understand what I'm saying? You have, why is that not relevant to us today? It is relevant. And you know what? It was a lot harder for them to make a decision like that than it is for you. And here's the thing. You don't live in a third world country. You live in a first world country and your problems, you know, if you complain, you sound like a whining baby. Right. Seriously. You really do. Imagine switching spots with some little child that his parents died when he was, you know, 12, 13 years old living in India and these little, like, you know, these, these, these anemic children that are going around literally sucking on rocks. Have you ever watched, you know, documentaries or ever looked up, like, how some of these kids live? Some of these children, they literally get by by sucking rocks. And they get the minerals that are on the rocks, out of the rocks, just to, like, sustain life for just a, a period of time because they're about to die. And they need anything that they can get. These kids that, like, they don't even have parents. And here's the thing. When you live in a heathen country like that, yes, us today, who we are, we've already been, we've already been you know, acclimated to a Christian society where we help one another. In India, it's not like that in heathen countries. You just think everyone's like that. People will not, they wouldn't just go out of their way to help a child or take a child in. They don't care. Because they're not, those are Christian values, and you take those types of things for granted. You think everybody thinks like that. No, you think like that because you grew up in a Christian nation. That's the only reason you think like that. Other people don't believe like that and they don't think like that. They would just allow it. It's not my responsibility is what they'd say. So you have these children who don't have parents. I mean, people are in situations like that. And then we want to cry and whine because we can't pay one bill. Or we can't buy this type of food or that type of food. Or we're having to eat whatever all the time. I eat sandwiches for lunch like every day. And I don't care at all. Amen. I don't care at all. That's a whole lot better than what a lot of people eat. Right. Seriously. You just need to, you know what you need to do in your lives? You need to live by faith. Amen. You need to look at your life and you need to say, nothing else really matters. I'm going to do what God tells me to do. I'm going to keep all of his commandments. I'm going to keep all of his statutes. And I'm going to just trust what Jesus says. When he says, everything's just going to work out. Just believe that it will work out. You just, you know what you have to do? It's this easy. Just believe it. It's not difficult. It's not hard. That is the main ingredient to the Christian life. It's not only the only thing that's needed to be saved. Once you're saved, you should keep God's commandments, but still, the same thing that got you saved is the main ingredient to have a successful Christian life. 
It really truly is. The main ingredient, the just shall live by faith. Of course, in context, yes, we need to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. But even after that, you need to live by faith, living by faith. You need to make your decisions based upon God's word. While we're in Hebrews, let's just flip over real quick to Hebrews chapter number 11. What is Hebrews chapter number 11 known as? The commentary. It's the faith chapter. Is this about salvation when you read about it? No. It's not. Think about that. These are the greatest feats that anyone has ever done. Does it tell you about Moses' salvation? Does it tell you about Noah's salvation? Does it tell you about you know, Samson's salvation or all these people's salvation, Abraham's salvation? No. It tells you about the great things that they were able to do in their Christian life because they had faith, because they trusted in the Lord. Think about that for a minute. Look at Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then it says this, For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And then he goes on and he starts giving you different things that people had done. Great heroes of the faith. It says, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained a witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had his testimony. Look at this, that he pleased God. Was that the faith that he supplied at the moment of his salvation? Is that the faith that he had to get saved? No. It's just the faith that he just lived by. He just had this faith. He just believed in God's word. He had, a, he had strong faith in the Lord. Look at verse 7. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. When we look at Noah, a lot of times, like I said, the Baptists will put the, after salvation, they'll put the emphasis upon the obedience of the Christian. And yes, I agree, the great obedience of Noah to build that ark. But imagine the, the, the faith that was required when God came to him and told him to build an ark. Imagine the faith that was required when he drove the first nail or the first rivet into a, you know, what would once be a 400-foot-sized boat. Imagine the great faith that was, that was required in order to do something like that. And what is Noah known for? If you're going to do great things in your Christian life, you're going to have to have great faith. The chapter that summarizes all of the great things of those that the Old Testament, of what they've done, you know what God says he's pleased with? The great faith that they had in their lives. And imagine how much faith it takes just to make the small decisions in a first world country of tithing your money. I just brought that up because it's a perfect example. Because finance is what everyone consumes themselves and worries about in the United States of America. Imagine the great faith. You know, imagine the little faith. No, not the great faith. The little faith that it takes just to make a small decision that you're going to follow some certain commandment of spanking your children. Oh, man. We need to put you in the hall. Of, we need to put you in Hebrews 11. You understand what I'm saying? How ridiculous that is? And people, when they make these decisions, are like, it's such a hard decision. No, it's not. Right. You didn't go through anything that these people went through. You know, real faith is... The decisions of all those that left Egypt. That was a big decision. Leaving their homes, packing up, leaving their homes, putting everything together and just following Moses out of the wilderness and just believing that God was going to take them unto a land that they've never seen. You know, miles and miles and miles away, and they know they're, going, they're traveling through the desert, just believing that God is going to provide everything for them. God says that during that whole time that he kept their shoes intact and all of that, that God did that. Do you know what he's implying? If he wouldn't have done that, what would have happened? They would have, had no, they would have been walking around barefoot. They would have had clothes. They wouldn't have had enough food. God had to provide man out in the wilderness. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I'm trying to compare this unto your situation. And you think that it's hard to make financial decisions in a first world country? People need more preaching on living their lives by faith. Because you know what we have in the United States of America, like I've already been hitting on you, is we have a bunch of baby Christians that think that they're making these big decisions. There's no persecution here. Even though this is the, you know, the New Testament talking about the great things that the Old Testament did, of the, the, the heroes of the Old Testament did, even those of the New Testament. They had it so much harder than what we have today. We don't go through anything what they went through. You know how small and minute the decisions are that we make in our Christian lives? They're very simple. They're very easy. You're not taking any kind of chance. 
But even when we are put into a decision or put into a circumstance where it might be a little bit difficult, what do you do? You need to live by faith. And you don't know what's going to happen. You know, we don't know how close we are to the end of the world. Then you're really going to find out. You're going to, you're, your faith is going to be really tried then. What kind of decision you're going to make. You know, and, and you may have a time in your life, too, at your job or whatever it may be, where somebody approaches you about something. They have to ask you a question. Hey, your boss calls you in. They're like, hey, I saw something on your Facebook that you posted. You know? With all this homo-loving stuff. Or my boss might call me in like, hey, I saw a video of you preaching. Do you believe this? Is this what you believe? What are you going to say? That, now, that's a little bit different, isn't it? That's a little bit of a bigger deal. What are you going to say? You know, well, you know, I shouldn't have said that. Or are you going to just believe the Bible and stand up for what the Bible says? What would you have to do? You'd have to live by faith and say, I'm just going to trust in God even if I lose my job. I'm just going to stand on God's word. I don't care. You know, you, you know what? You need to, we need to not, you know, we need to put all, it's not only just our salvation. We need to not only put all the emphasis on, hey, you, know, you believe in the Lord just for your salvation. We need to be emphasizing in our Christian lives daily, walking by faith, living by faith. It's not over after you get saved. Right. That, was, that was hard. I'm going to put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all done now. No, you need to be living your life by faith. Every day you need to be making your decisions based upon faith. Every day you need to be making... And you know what? Sometimes faith, putting your faith in what God has told you to do, may feel like and look like the wrong decision. You understand what I'm saying? If I make this decision, it, like statistically, it doesn't look like it's going to add up. Or, you know, the probability of me doing this, this is probably going to end up bad. But God promises that it won't. God promises that he'll provide for you as long as you're putting him first, as long as you're, you know. And here's the thing. The outcome of that specific situation, I'm not promising you the way that it will turn out. But you know what Jesus does promise? He promises that he'll give you the necessities. And he promises, even to his disciples and his apostles, he tells them that if they're willing to leave, you know, father and mother, leave their lands, he says that he will give them things in this, in this world and the world to come. There are promises, you know. You know, we can we can kind of go too far away. What people can overreact when someone's like tr preaching something false or they're abusing something something in the Bible. We can sometimes overreact and go too far the other way. You have all these prosperity preachers that are just like everything will be great no matter what. Send me ten bucks and you'll get a hundred dollars in the mail next week. You know, people that just exaggerate stuff. But there are promises. That God gives to people that if you do this and you do that, I'll bless you in this life and the life to come. There are promises like that. And God will bless you. And God will provide certain things for you, but not if you don't have faith. Not if you're not even willing to just step out and say, not, you know, if you're not even, if you're not even just willing to just believe what he says and then do it. It's not that hard. And look, and like I said, look at our lives today. Look at how we live today. Is it anything like those of Hebrews 11? Look at the end of the chapter. We'll end right here. <clears throat> Look at Hebrews 11. We'll begin reading in... Uh, let's start reading in verse 30. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not, when she had received the spies with peace. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the alien. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourging. Yea, moreover, bonds and imprisonment. Imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. I mean, that means they were cut in half. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. Why? It's talking about because they had great faith. Because they trusted God, even when they're put into a situation like that, because of their faith, it's saying. That's what caused that to happen. Because they weren't willing to deny their faith. They were still willing to trust God, even in a situation like that. So they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword, saying they were killed with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, 
tormented. Notice that they, you know what's funny is notice what they have. Notice what they still have. They had clothing. And what did Jesus say that he would give them? Even if you look at the situation with Elijah, he had clothing and what did he have? I'll take you to, I'm going to take you to a creek and I'll give you water and then I'm going to have a raven bring you what? Food. What are the three things that he promises that he'll give you? Those are promises. He, he's telling you you're not going to die. You're not going to starve. I'll keep you alive. And even when you see these people who are going through hard times, great things for God, they had their priorities right. God made sure he, had, he gave them clothing, didn't he? It's funny that it brings that one thing up. About in sheepskins and goatskins being destitute, destitute, afflicted, tormented. Verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy. That's, a, that's an amazing statement right there. Just slap right there in the middle. And it's in parentheses. He tells you like... If you were to just be able to look in the past, if you, if you had the perception of the world of who these people were, they'd say, these people are losers. They have nothing. Look at these guys wandering around in sheepskin and goats. They have nothing. They're destitute. These guys are losers. And you know what God says? Of whom the world was not worthy. These people weren't even worthy to be around, these prophets. Of whom the world's not even worthy. It's a, it's a very interesting statement that God just puts in there for being in parentheses. It's interesting. He says, they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. He says, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Talking about, he goes into chapter 12, and he talks about all the great things that we should be able to do in the New Testament. All the great things that are going to be done in the New Testament before the end. So, you know, the Bible tells us in Daniel says that there are going to be great exploits that are done. Here's the thing. They did great things in the Old Testament. They were willing to, to suffer and to die. They were willing to go through all this. They kept commandments. They got, and Noah built the ark when he was told to do so, right? But what was it that enabled them to be a great Christian? What was it that enabled them to be able to put, be put in Hebrews chapter number 11? The fact that they had faith, that they believed God, they put their faith in the Bible, that they put their faith in God's Word. That they believe that things will work out even if they don't look like they're going to work out. I'm still going to make the decision that God tells me to do. It's easy to make a decision by faith when it looks like. That's not even technically by faith. You know, obviously you're still living by God's word. But when, if you make a certain, a specific decision, you know, it would be by faith, but there's nothing daring. If you make a certain decision in your life and there's nothing really to lose, of course, that's the decision you would have made without the Bible. You understand what I'm saying? But when you're making a decision where it looks like you will lose something, where it looks like you might lose your job, you might lose money, you might not have enough money, you might, whatever may happen, you might be persecuted, whatever, something bad, something you're, you're going to put yourself into a dangerous situation by making this choice, that's when you're trying. That's when, you know, that's when the faith is really going to kick in. That's when you're really going to be tested and tempted and tried whether you really are going to live by faith. And you need to put the emphasis not only on keeping the commandments in your daily life. You need to put the emphasis on making sure that you follow God's commandments and that you live your life by faith. Living by faith. It's not over when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just Acts 16, 30, 31, going to heaven. No, it actually just begins right there. And you need to, like, like uh, 2 Peter says in chapter number 1, you need to add unto your faith virtue. Your faith doesn't go anywhere. You need to add unto your faith. Right? The faith, we need to continue to live by faith. The faith stays with us, and that's what's going to enable you to live a great Christian life, to do the things that they did. To be successful in your Christian life, you have to trust that God is going to provide for you, do great things for you in your Christian life. And the only way you're going to make that decision, it starts with what? Just believing in the Lord. Put your faith in God that everything will work out. His power has an word for you. Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, that we have uh, the God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord of lords to trust in. And when we live by faith, that we can we can live by faith, but we can have uh, something that we can anchor our souls to in hope, and something that can be trusted. And it's not shifting sand, dear Lord God, but it's tried and it's true. And uh, we're thankful for the King James Bible, dear Lord, that you preserved your word for us today, dear God. And we can know that we have your word. And we we don't even have to when we read your word. We don't you know we don't sit down and we don't you know, wonder whether certain things are true. But we can just we can just. As I said, anchor our souls to it and know that it's true. We can just trust your word, uh, just as those did uh, in Samaria. You know, they believed that you would provide for them. Help us just to put our faith in you, that you will provide for us.
but to put first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. And not to seek money, not to seek fame, not to seek, you know, mammon and the things of this world. Just help us to have strong faith in you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.